In this tutorial, we will learn how to run a multiple linear regression model in R, and specifically we'll use the regression function from the lessr package. And so as a quick reminder, a simple linear regression model has a single predictor variable and one outcome variable, whereas a multiple linear regression model has two or more predictor variables and a single outcome variable. So if you haven't already, to begin, open up RStudio. Go to File, New File, R Script to open up your script editor, your R Script file window here. And I'm going to make a quick note using the hashtag annotation tool that this is a multiple linear regression in R tutorial here. Okay, so the first thing, let's set our working directory. And I'm going to use the setwd function from base R, and I'll type in my working directory directly here in the quotation marks, which is my H drive. Our workshop. And this is where the data file that we'll be using today, which is called selection exercise.csv, is located. And so I can click run to run that, or I could go to session, set working directory, choose directory to do this manually through drop down windows and selecting the folder that contains the data file we wish to read in. The next thing we're going to do is read in the data. Okay. And I'm going to use the reader package because it has the read underscore function that I'd like to use to read in the data. And so here I'm typing in the, the install.packages function here with the reader package name and quotation marks to install it if I were to need to do that. I don't need to do this. I've already installed this very recently. You may need to update it. So if that's the case, go ahead and click run and update this um, now. You do need to, however, after you've installed the package, or if you already have the package, use the library function with reader with no quotation marks as the sole argument. Run that to access the reader package and all of its functions. And so again, the name of the, the, the function we're gonna use is read underscore CSV, but first we need to come up with a name for the data frame object that we're gonna read in and create. I'm calling this selection with a capital S and using that left-handed arrow to name it. And now I, I enter in the read underscore CSV function and this is the selection exercise.csv is the name of the file. How do I know that? Well, if I go to my working directory, I have a file that's called selection exercise with a capital S for selection, a capital E for exercise, and it is comma separated values, so CSV. So do make sure that you add the CSV here. So let's click run to read that in. Great. Now I can see in my global environment, I have the selection data frame object. And just a quick orientation to this, we have our unique identifier variable here, ID, and then we have three selection tools or predictor variables that we're gonna to use today. SJT for situational judgment tests, the type of selection tool that many organizations use. We also have the emotional intelligence, let's say inventory or test, and a proactivity, it's a personality assessment test as well. Here is our criterion or outcome variable of interest, performance, and let's assume this is job evaluation ratings. And this is a turnover variable that we're not going to use today, but it is in the data frame. Okay. And so assume that higher scores on these four variables mean that people are more likely to have higher levels of these, which we'll assume is a good thing. Higher SJT is a good thing. Higher EQ or emotional intelligence is a good thing. Higher proactivity is a good thing. And higher performance is a good thing here. Okay. And so this is part of, let's assume, a concurrent validation design. We collected these data with current job incumbents. And these are people that once they've been on the job for 90 days, maybe a probationary period or something like that, we gave them these selection tools here just to get their data and that these aren't consequential, that how they scored on this will not affect their, their future in the organization. We just want to use them as a proxy for applicants that would ultimately be given these selection tools as part of the selection process. Now let's assume at 90 days about there, they also have a performance rating as conducted by a supervisor, and that is a behavioral rating. And so we use scores from that as being evidence of the criterion. In this case, that's job performance, okay? So how many people are we talking about in this study, this validation study that we're doing, where ultimately we're interested in assessing the criterion related validity of these different selection tools, and then putting them into a model together, a multiple linear regression model, where we can see, okay, does each one of these tool explain unique variability or variance in performance when we account for or control for the other selection tools or variables in our model. So if we use the in row function here from base R and type in the name of our data frame object and run that, we see that there's 300 people in this, this 
sample here in our data frame, okay? And let's use the names function and selection, name of our data frame. Object here is the sole argument and the names function to see what are the names of the variables, just in case we need to copy and paste them in a second, okay? Now this next part, I'm gonna breeze through, and that is assessing the criterion related validities of the selection tools in models by themselves, okay? So this is typically where we start. And there's different ways of doing this, but typically you want to establish first that each selection tool by itself in a model, a simple linear regression model or using correlation, that it is associated with scores on selection tool is associated with scores on that criterion, which is often job performance, okay? So how would we do that? Well, you could use simple linear regression. And what I'm gonna do here is really, really quick. Normally, if you're doing this, you need to test all the statistical assumptions for running each one of these models and so forth. There's another tutorial called Simple Linear Regression in R that explains what those statistical assumptions are. We're gonna assume that all of those have been met in this case. And here's what you would do in terms of the logical process uh, prior to getting to the multiple linear regression model. Because what we're gonna do here is assume that we're only gonna include variables in our multiple linear regression model in this case, selection tools as our predictor variables, we're only gonna include those selection tools that have a statistically significant association with job performance in models by themselves, okay? So we're going to use from the less R package a particular function, okay, it's a regression function, but first we need to make sure that we have access to that less R or package here, which is less R with a capital R. We can use that install packages again, as before, I've recently installed that, so I don't need to run that, but you might need to run that, okay? So be sure to run this if you have it. Now here's that library function less R, definitely run this. This will access our package and the associated functions. So if you've followed along with the simple linear regression model, there's a regression function with a capital R that we're actually gonna use for multiple linear regression today, but that generates a lot of output and for simplicity in this, since I'm breezing through this part of the tutorial here, uh, I'm gonna use the reg.brief function, which is a short output version of the regression function from less R. And so first you need to specify what is your regression model. And this is a simple linear regression model. And so remember our outcome variable is performance. You can see it here. So we could just copy this and paste it here. So we enter that before the tilde. And the tilde, I'll explain what that means in a second, um, is what separates here our outcome variable to the left and our predictor variable to the right. Okay, so the first predictor variable is SJT, so let's copy that and paste here. Okay, and so what this is, is a regression model that says performance is regressed on SJT scores. Okay, and so again, the tilde, you can think of it as meaning regressed on, okay? Then we do data equals, and the name of the data frame object from which these two variables come from, okay? So now we have the, the regression, the reg.brief function specified in the way we need it to, to get output. So let's click run. And as I said, very quickly, what we're interested in here is just, is this selection tool, SJT, statistically associated with job performance? And here we see, here's the regression weight, but really we just wanna know the p-value here, it, it is. So in this case, uh, this we can say that SJT or situational judgment test scores are positively associated to a statistically significant extent with job performance scores. And we can also come down here and see that the R squared values and the adjusted R squared values are in what we'd call the medium to large range, okay? And I'll give you some reals, rules of thumb when we get to the multiple linear regression that you can use for that. Okay, so that's the first selection tool. Let's now paste this below. And our second selection tool, if we scroll up here, is emotional intelligence. So let's copy that and just replace SJT here. Okay, so now let's test the criteria related validity of emotional intelligence in relation to job performance. Let's click run. So we're gonna, again, breeze through this. And here we see, here's emotional intelligence, the regression estimate, it's positive, it's 0.698. Associated p-value is less than the conventional cutoff value of 0.052 tailed. And so again, we'd say that this emotional intelligence test scores, they're, they're statistically significantly associated in a positive direction with job performance, okay? And we see that the R squared values, the adjusted R squared values are, um, I would say medium large range still. 
Okay, let's copy this. And then one more time, now with the third selection tool, which is proactivity. So scrolling back up here to our names output, proactivity, it's a personality assessment, let's say, paste it here, replace that as the predictor variable, and let's click run. And let's see how this one did. Okay, so basic analysis here, we see that the regression coefficient is 0.487. This is unstandardized, so you can't really compare it directly to the other regression coefficients we just saw, but here's the p-value. This signals that this is a positive and statistically significant association between proactivity and job performance, which is the outcome variable for each of these. Again, our R-squared values are all about in the same range, so these are medium to large effects or practical significance we're talking about here. So what we could say now is that we have reasonably good justification for including all three of these selection tools in a multiple linear regression model. What we're trying to identify with the multiple linear regression model is the extent to which each one of these selection tools here explains unique variability in job performance. If two, if one doesn't explain significant variability in job performance when controlling for or accounting for the others, which is what happens in a multiple linear regression model, then we're kind of concluding that, well, that one may not be that useful, okay? So it doesn't have any added predictive value to us. And so when you think of a world of limited resources where each one of these things takes up organizational resources to administer, as well as an applicant time, and applicants tend to not like to run through too many things and they can have poor applicant reactions that can affect their decisions to accept a job offer should they receive one, we need to think of all these different things. Okay, so let's move forward now. And now we're gonna run our multiple linear regression model. Okay, and the way that we're going to do this is that we are going to use the, and again, we're assuming that you've already um, done all the statistical, associate, uh, statistical assumption testing needed for these simple linear regression models, which means that hopefully we already found evidence that the, each one of these is free of bivariate outliers, that they are these are linear associations. That's really important that we expect these to be linear and not nonlinear, as well as that there is not bivariate normal distributions and so forth. The and and so hopefully you establish all of those statistical assumptions up here because some of those are relevant down here. Okay. Now in particular, the one related to the fact that each one of these needs to have a linear association. Each one of these selection tools needs to have a linear association with our outcome variable here, okay? So let's assume we've already met those in a previous step there. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the regression function. We'll use the full version of the function now in terms of the output um, from less r. So we're using the less r package once more here. And so first we're gonna enter our outcome variable to the left of the tilde and to the right of the tilde, we're gonna enter each one of our predictor variables and separate them with a plus sign. So we're adding additional predictor variables. In this case, these are selection tools to assess their overall, um, the extent to which all three of them predict job performance collectively, as well as the extent to which each one predicts unique variability in job performance above and beyond the others. So the next one is emotional intelligence. So let's copy that, paste here. And let's say the next one is proactivity. And then I am going to do a return here. So I'm gonna add this into a different line. You can keep it on the same line if you want. And then just note that all three of these are all these variables in our regression model here. This is our multiple linear regression model. They all come from our selection data frame, okay? So now we are ready to run this regression model here. And one thing I will point out, you, can, you will get an error message if these plots, or if this window, your plot window is too small. So make sure you give yourself enough space so that this will run properly. And you'll know you'll get an error message, but if you can't figure out what it means, it means open up your plot window, okay? Okay, so let's start with diagnostic test. And here it's actually pretty awesome. You get this, this is a scatter plot matrix here is your third plot. And so you get the scatter plot. These are the associations between each one of the variables here. And here's performance, and so this, column here gives us the association between performance and SJT, emotional intelligence and performance, and proactivity and performance. And this will give you an idea. You could eyeball those uh, the assumption of linearity between the each predictor and the outcome variable. These are bivariate associations. We'd call these zero order um, associations 
because they're not controlling for anything or looking at the partial correlation between each one of these uh, predictors in relation to the outcome while controlling for the others. Instead, it's just these are separate correlations and scatter plots run for each bivariate association here. In the upper diagonal, we actually have the correlation values here. Okay, and note that you can click back here, which we'll do in a second. But first, let's take one of the biggest things we need to consider when we're doing multiple linear regression is the assumption of, some people call it multi-collinearity, commonly it's called collinearity. Okay, so I'll put both there, is the assumption of multi-collinearity, okay? So this is something we want to avoid this. So collinearity refers to a situation in which two or more of your predictor variables are overlapping substantially with each other, meaning that they, if you ignore the outcome variable, the predictor variables are highly correlated with each other. Okay, and so what is a high correlation? Well, you know, generally speaking, you, you can get away with quite a bit in multiple linear regression. So here we see the correlation between SJT and proactivity is 0.24. That's fine. Okay, this is a, would consider kind of a moderate size correlation or between proactivity and emotional intelligence is 0.32. Still fine here. Okay, but look at this correlation here between SJT and um, emotional intelligence, 0.93. Remember, a correlation ranges from zero to one, positive, negative. And so a one or a negative one means a perfect positive or a perfect negative linear association. This is 0.93. This is staggeringly high here. Now, what this means is that these two variables here, and imagine both of these are, both of these are gonna have measurement error too associated with them. There's sampling error in this as well. This is probably an underestimate of how strong this association is. These are practically the same variable. So these are, whatever the SJT, the situational judgment test is measuring, it's probably emotional intelligence or whatever this emotional intelligence test is actually measuring here. Generally speaking, if you have a correlation of 0.85 or higher, whether that's positive or negative, you can pretty much consider the two variables to be indistinguishable from one another, statistically speaking. So this right over here, this is a this is a right off a red flag that we've got some collinearity issue between these two variables here. Okay, so what else can we look at? Well, we're gonna skip through some of our output here and we're gonna skip down to the section that says collinearity. And what you'll see here is that there are two collinearity statistics. There's tolerance and there is valence inflation factor or VIF, okay? We're only gonna focus on tolerance. And why is that? Well. The tolerance is simply the reciprocal of the VIF, okay? So if you take one divided by VIF, you get the tolerance here, okay? And I think the tolerance is a little bit more intuitive to understand. One, a value of 1.0 in tolerance means, okay, no collinearity issues, this is fine. Now, when you start getting collinearity issue, or tolerance that is closer to zero, you start running into collinearity, okay? And this is actually derived from an R squared value, a variance explained value if you were to kick out the, um, the actual performance or the outcome variable in the model and just focus on the predictors, you know, sets of predictors predicting another predictor, that's where this comes from here, okay? And so zero is actually a really bad thing here. This would mean that you have a lot of overlap, okay? And generally a rule of thumb is that when you get a tolerance statistic that's, that's 0 0.20 or below, you've got some problems, okay? You've got issues of collinearity and probably a violation of that assumption. And so here we see, wow, SJT. So if we look at the tolerance for SJT when uh, predicted by, or the association with SJT in relation to these two other predictor variables, that it's 0.127, so that's problematic. And we also see the same thing for emotional intelligence. Now, because both of these are low for SJT and emotional intelligence, and we know this correlation between SJT and emotional intelligence is 0.93, these are the culprits right here. So we need to figure out, we can't run this model or interpret this model as is. We need to drop SJT or emotional intelligence, okay? These are too highly correlated with one another. So there's a lot of different ways you can make this decision, okay? In this case, do it based on obviously the statistical information you have, but also make the decision. So make decision to drop, let's say we're gonna drop emotional intelligence, okay? Now we could have just as easily dropped SJT. Why are we dropping emotional intel or intelligence? Let's assume that we've looked through our resource availability, um, applicant reactions to emotional intelligence tests versus the situational judgment test. 
costs, all those kinds of things, time to administer. And we find that, wow, emotional intelligence is just more expensive. People don't like it as much to take this test. And so we're going to drop that one. So you, you really have to look to uh, qualitative information, contextual information in your organization to help make these decisions. Okay. And so this suggests the sub inherently subjective nature of model building sometimes when it comes to um, statistics and specifically multiple linear regression here. Okay, so let's proceed forward now. I'm gonna copy this exact same. So we're going back to the drawing board here. I'm gonna copy the exact same script as before, but I'm gonna drop out from our multiple linear regression model that we specified here. I'm dropping out emotional intelligence. We're just gonna focus on SJT and proactivity. Because these are so highly correlated, SJT and emotional intelligence, neither one, one is going to not add any predictive utility for the model, okay, in terms of explaining job performance or performance as our criterion of interest. So let's now rerun our model, which we're now focusing on the unique contributions of SJT and proactivity when both are in the model in relation to job performance. And Let's take a look here. So we already knew these correlations from before. We know SJT and proactivity have a reasonable amount of correlation. This is not concerning here, 0.24, that's fine. And looking at collinearity, wow, this is much better. So the tolerance statistic is now 0.944. And so remember, when you get to 1.0, that's good. 0.2 or less is bad. And so here, we're looking good here, okay? So now we don't have any concern about, viol or very little concern about violating that assumption of collinearity, okay? So let's say now collinearity assumption is met based on tolerance statistic, okay? All right, so the next thing we need to do is test some other assump assumptions of multiple linear regression here. And so I'm gonna close that window a little bit so I can see this more clearly. Make sure I'm in the right one. Okay, so I'm gonna scroll up in the output here. So here's the top of the output. And now I'm going to come down to the residuals and influence table here. And I'm going to thumb over here in the plots. Okay. To, oops. Here is, here is a useful plot here. And so this is the same as in simple linear regression, where if we plot all the residuals or errors in prediction, essentially, um, using the line that we derive from the regression model, these errors or residuals should be normally distributed. And here's the histogram, here's the actual true normal distribution here, and here's that density distribution function here. And we see this is actually pretty good. So we can probably, based on the uh, distribution of residuals plot, that we have met um, the assumption of normal of normally distributed residuals okay all right so now let's thumb over here going and we see that we have the fitted values so let's now say based on the fitted values residuals plot we have the fitted values and so here we can test the assumptions or, or try to test the assumptions that our average residual error is zero for each level of the predictor variables that we have in our model, as well as the variances of the residuals are equal. This is that homoscedasticity assumption, okay? And um, the way that we can assess this is that ideally, we'd want this, this solid line here to be completely superimposing this dotted line here at the zero point of the y-axis, okay? Because this would indicate that if we have this, that we have, um, that our average residual error is about zero for each level here. Now we see there's some deviation here. Now, this might not look good, but this is actually not too bad. When you're working with real data, we're not gonna see this perfectly aligned, okay? Now, the other thing we wanna see is, okay, if we're looking across, how are the distributions or the variances at different levels of these fitted values, which then implies different levels of the predictor variables? And you know what? It's not great. But it's also, we don't see any clear like funnel shape or anything that would indicate that we have heteroscedasticity. So it appears that we have homoscedasticity in these error variants or the error in the variance of the errors or the residuals, however you want to call them. Okay. So this isn't too bad, but we do see this one case is fla flagged as an extreme case here potentially. And this is case row number associated, row number 201, the case associated with that is being flagged here as maybe being an extreme value. Okay. And so. 
here we do have some potential concern that, okay, so let's say that we have, have some confidence we have met the assumption of homo skedasticity of variances and the assumption of average residual variance being somewhat close to zero, okay? And, but still, you know, not great. So let's look at, now go to the residuals and influence and see what to extent to some of these extreme cases or potentially what we call multivariate outliers might have on our, uh, our fitted values here. And so our top candidate here is 2001, that row number. And here we have SJT score for that person. These are their observed data, uh, proactivity score, their performance, okay? Here's the fitted value here. So this is what using the regression equation, which we'll get to in a second, that if you were to plug in what their observed values are, you'd predict that they'd have a performance score of 10.986. Now you can see that performance here, their actual observed performance is 24. If we take 24 minus this 10.986, we get the residual here. Now, just as we would with the simple linear regression model here, we can use Cook's distance to as an indicator of, uh, or Cook's D for short, as an indicator of multivariate outliers. And so we're looking for values that are larger than zero here, okay? And what we see is that, wow, 0 0.173, yeah, this is maybe getting into the realm of two, row number 201 might be a potential outlier, their data, as well as we're seeing uh, 70, 170, 270. These also seem to be potentially problematic because all of these have higher Cook's values of 0 0.10. Again, there's no like set rule of thumb that you can use, but generally higher values are worse and you're looking for ones that are more extreme relative to others as well, okay? And so there's actually some potentially influential cases here. So towards the end of this tutorial, we'll loop back and we'll actually see how we could actually drop these outliers. And But in general, I have a really good argument if you're gonna drop any cases. That's a slippery slope because again, when we're talking about, this is a sample of people we're working from from an underlying population. And one of the assumptions that we can't test really directly in most cases is that these cases were randomly selected from the underlying population, okay? Now that's a tough assumption to meet. And if to the extent to which these weren't randomly sampled from the underlying population, we might have sampling error that might actually, these people right here might actually be very indicative of people in the underlying population, but maybe we just didn't get enough of them in this sample here, okay? So just some things to consider. Okay, but for now, let's assume that let's go, we have a reasonable confidence that we've met all the statistical assumptions needed to interpret this multiple linear regression model. So let's jump into the actual interpretation. So starting with the background section here, you get the name of your data frame, you get the name of your response variable, which is another name for your outcome variable, sometimes called dependent variable. And then we also have predictor variable one, it's our situational judgment test, SJT, and the proactivity test here as well. Here we see the number of people or cases in our data frame, rows in this case, is 300, and we retained all of the people, meaning there was no missing data on any one of these variables for these people because it does use listwise deletion by default here. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna do is this is a, we're going to do, look at the basic analysis section here, and first we're gonna look at the table called estimated model. This is where we're gonna get the substantive information about the extent to which each predictor variable, in this case it's selection tool, predicts job performance score when statistically controlling for the other. Because that's what we're doing with a multiple linear regression model, okay? We're partialing out the variability um, associated with one predictor variable when interpreting a focal inter uh, predictor variable. So like you would with a simple linear regression model, you get your intercept value here. The p-value would just mean whether or not this intercept value of 5.55. Five is statistically significantly different from zero, okay? In this case, we see it is, but we're really only interested in this value, the extent to which we want to use this equation to predict future scores of performance based on scores of these um, selection tools here. So let's now look at the row that is associated with SJT. Here, the estimate is 0.561, so this is a regression coefficient, slope, weight, whatever you wanna call it, it's standard error, the t-value associated with it in terms of this t-distribution, and then the p-value. Now, this p-value of 0 0.000 is less than the conventional cutoff of 0.05 two-tailed, which is the typical alpha level that we use. So this would indicate that there, 
this SJT variable, the selection tool, is statistically associated with job performance still, even when controlling for scores on proactivity and the influence of proactivity or the association with proactivity and job performance, okay, which is our outcome. And so you get your 95% confidence interval as well. Okay, so this is this means good. This SJT variable is explaining unique variance in our outcome variable of performance, even when accounting for or controlling for proactivity. Now let's look at proactivity. Now here we see that proactivity, the regression weight is 0.386. The associated p-value is less than 0.052 tailed. And so this is also positively and statistically associated with performance when controlling for the other variable, which in this case means controlling for SJT. Okay, so when controlling for each other, both of these variables are still statistically associated with job performance. And so what this means is that both explain incremental variability in job performance over and beyond or above and beyond the other variable in the model, okay? So now let's look at model fit here. So model fit here, we're interested in R squared and adjusted R squared. And we see that the R squared, which is sample specific is 0.266 and the adjusted R squared is slightly smaller, which you would expect and this is uh, adjusted for the number of variables, predictor variables we have, and the sample size, and we see that it's 0.261. And so you can interpret, uh, let's just interpret adjusted R squared here. Typically you wanna report both, and at the very least adjusted R squared. We see that the adjusted R squared value is 0.261. If you multiply that by 100, you get a percentage, and you can interpret this as collectively, the selection tools of SJT and proactivity explain 26.1% of the variability or variance in job performance scores. Okay, so that's actually pretty good. Um, a rule of thumb for that, so let's do um, rule of thumb for R squared. Okay, and let's, the typical rule of thumb would be 0 0.01 is going to be small, 0 0.09 is going to be medium, and 0.25 is going to be large by conventional standards. And so what this is saying is, wow, this is even the adjusted is above the large, about the large point here. So we'd say this is a large effect. Collectively, these two very these two selection tools explain um, a large amount of variance. So this is their practical significance collectively in that outcome variable. So this is pretty exciting here. Now, if you think about it, this still means that in this case we still have about you know 74% of the variability is still left unexplained. When you're talking about applying this to future applicants, potentially, that's actually pretty good. Um, you know, we're trying to, we'll have other sources of information, presumably these might not be all the selection tools that we'll use, but we're starting to explain um, a significant portion of variability here, and that's good. So model fits the data pretty well here. Now, this F statistic and its associated P value and degrees of freedom, this is associated with these R squared values here. And so this is just saying, is this R squared value, are these statistically significantly different from zero? Because this P value is less than 0.05, we would say yes, these are statistically significantly different from zero. And in other words, this is, this is a test of whether or not these R squared values, whether including the selection tools in the model results in the model better fitting the data than a model where you didn't have these selection tools included or a null model in other words, okay? Looking down here, we also have the analysis of variance section. These, this is not often of substantive interest here. Um, what we do see here is that the F value here is gonna be exactly the same as the one here because we're interested in the overall model here, okay? But um, the P values here for each of these predictors will be equivalent to these two P values here that we see in the estimated value. So we don't really need to focus on those. Now we also get the relations among variables section here, and here we have the correlation matrix. And we can see that we already, um, we can see here that the, the zero order correlation, so by itself, SJT has a correlation with performance of 0.42, okay? So that's a medium large correlation. And then also proactivity, it's about 0.39 correlation between that and performance. So that's, that's another medium large correlation, okay? Because if you, rules of thumb for correlation, just to remind you are this, okay? So it's 0 0.10, 0 0.30, and 0 0.50, and this is for R, little r, which we'll say correlation. Okay, so this is not partialing out or controlling for any of the other variables. These are direct zero order correlations here. 
So why would you look at this? Well, remember up here, this is our unstandardized regression coefficients, and these are not strictly pure estimates of the association between SJT and the outcome variable or proactivity and the outcome variable because we are statistically controlling for other variables in the model, okay? And so this is a good way of looking at the effect size of just each one of these predictor variables by themselves. Now, if you, above, we already ran the simple linear regression models with each of these by themselves. This will be a review for you, okay? Um, but just in case you've forgotten, that information is provided here. We've already looked at collinearity here. We can ignore this section here, okay, for now. And we've already looked at residuals and influence. And the forecasting error, this is, gets into prediction intervals. And it were, it's assuming that if you were to pretend like we did have a separate set of data here with which to validate or to test this model, um, you can get the prediction intervals here, okay? And so what we have now is we have estimated a multiple linear regression model. And we found evidence that both of these selection tools explain a significant amount of variability in the, the outcome variable. So their criteria related validity still stand even when in terms of being statistically significant when controlling for other selection tools that we've included in this model. Now, this is where you get this cool com combinatoria or combination effect or collective effect is that, remember, I just showed you that these correlations zero order correlations between each of these predictor variables, we could categorize those as being medium to large in magnitude. But when we look collectively at the R squared values, these are now large, they've moved up. And that is because these two variables together are actually explaining more variability than either one of these variables by themselves, which is what we hope for, okay? So this means we're getting more explanatory power out of this model by including both of these selection tools as opposed to just one of them, okay? Now, as promised, how do we estimate? Eventually, I'll get to how do we remove those uh, potential outliers or extreme cases that we want to remove. But now let's talk about getting standardized regression coefficients. Fortunately, this is pretty easy. I'm just pasting that script from below. And I'm going to add an additional argument, which is just standardize. Okay and set it to true. This will give us our standardized regression coefficients. And I'm gonna change regression here to just that brief one that we used at the, the beginning, just so I can quickly get the output here. Okay, because the diagnostics will remain the same. Okay, and so if we scroll here, now we go to our estimated model section. These are the standardized regression coefficients. Now, because these are now in standardized units here, you can, um, you can make interpretations based on these. Uh, you can actually, it's not a good idea, this is really controversial, but technically you can compare the magnitude of these two co regression coefficients. But do remember that they have some shared variance here. So these are not precise estimates because they are fighting over some of the shared variance with themselves. Okay, so this, these are the standardized regression coefficients if you chose to report those, you're welcome to. Um, but typically we don't use those when we're trying to estimate the model that we found above. So like if we go back to this model up here, if we're trying to interpret this, we often like to interpret these in the context of selection in their raw units, okay? So for instance, we could interpret uh, this, this is going back up to our unstandardized version. So this regression coefficient for SJT in the context of this model would indicate the following. SJT um, is that for every one unit increase in situational judgment test scores, there is a 0.561 increase in job performance scores when controlling for other predictors in the model. In this case, there's just one other predictor, which is proactivity, okay? And then you could say it, vice, say it the opposite way with proactivity here, okay? But especially if we're gonna specify the regression model, we typically use the unstandardized coefficients. And just how we would do this, let's say that we have our outcome variable, we'll just call this predict performance predict here. So this is not the observed values, but this is what we would expect based on our model. And then we have our intercept value is 5.555 plus the regression coefficient for SJT. So let's enter that. And let's just remind ourselves that we can plug in those SJT scores. And then finally, the regression coefficient for proactivity and let's just remind ourselves this belongs to the proactivity, okay? Now, what we can do here is we can plug in some values if we wish to predict, okay, what is the outcome going to be or what is our performance going to be predicted if we plug in different values here, okay? So 
For SJT, let's assume we have a new sample. We have an, we're applying this to applicants in the future. We have an SJT score of six and a proactivity score of, let's say, 10, okay? And then, so here's our y-intercept here, our constant in the model. And if we run this, here's our predicted value down here. So it's 12 point. This is what we would expect in terms of predicted performance based on someone who has a score of six on the SJT and a score of 10 on that proactivity tool. Okay, so this is where we're starting to get into predictive modeling here. And again, we typically use the unstandardized model to estimate this because it's in the units of the original measures, the proactivity measure, the performance measure, the SJT measure, and so forth. When we come down here, this is now getting into the standardized version. This is now in standardized units here, okay? So essentially what we've done in this model is we've converted each of these variables, including the outcome to Z scores, okay? So meaning there's, their mean is now zero, their standard deviation and variances are one, okay? All right, so that's how you do standardized regression coefficients. What if we wanna remove those cases associated with row numbers, I think it was uh, 201, 70, 170, and 270. Remember, those were we flagged those as potentially problematic cases that we might need to remove, okay? So the way that we can do this is, fortunately in this case, we have our row numbers here. So let's say we go to 201, who is that? Their unique identifier variable just so happens to be 201, that's easy. And if we go down to 70, we see that their unique identifier happens to be 70. I'll save you the suspense, but it's the same for 270 and 170 as well. Okay, so this means we can, we've identified those unique identifier uh, values that we'd like to remove corresponding with those rows, okay? So how do we do that? Well, let's, um, let's actually just copy and paste this script that we just used here and we'll delete that standardize for now. Standardize, standardize equals true argument. And now we're gonna type in an argument instead called row equals. And now we're gonna put in a conditional statement essentially. And what we're gonna do is because we have multiple values, okay, we are going to do this. Um, and just keep in mind, if we had a single value, for instance, we would do ID is not equal to, and then let's say 201. If that's all we wanted to remove, we could run this. And I'm using the reg.brief function here just to get brief output. And if we go up here, we'll see, okay, now we're down to just one, two, we've removed that one case that's associated with row number, or with ID number 201, we're down to 299 from 301. Okay, but that's not what we want here. We actually have multiple, um, cases that we want to remove. And so to do that, we're gonna use a little bit different way syntax here. So we're gonna use the, the, first we're gonna put not, so exclamation point, not ID, okay? And then we're gonna do the operator within. So it's percent in, okay? It'll gray out if it's worked properly. And then we're gonna use the C function from base R to combine values into a vector. Remember we have uh, ID variable, or ID value, 201, 70, 170, and two, 270, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and so what we're saying here is if we didn't have this exclamation point right here, it would just say select those cases for which ID, um, the ID value is equal to some value in this vector here. So it would just retain these four cases by putting the exclamation point here, which stands for not in our language, we're saying we want to include those all except. So we don't want to include the this vector cases that are associated with this vector of values that's associated with this ID variable. Because remember, ID variable here, capital I, capital D, is our unique identifier variable. So watch what happens when we run this. Okay. So we go up and now we see that we're down to 296. So we've lost the four people. Okay. And that was intentional here. And then you would go through and you'd say, okay, does the model still stand? We actually see here the pattern of results is about the same. Both of the tools are still statistically significantly associated and positively associated with the outcome variable. Um, we actually see our R squared value goes up in a, in a very large extent here from, it was like 0.26 something to now 0.37. 
But again, we need to be really careful about this because these people right here might actually be very indicative of the underlying population, but we may have just had poor sampling. So again, be cautious about removing outliers and provide justifications if you choose to do so, okay? All right. Well, that wraps up this tutorial on multiple linear regression in R. There's other functions you can use to run a multiple linear regression, namely the LM function from base R, but the regression function from the less R package can be used for simple linear regression, multiple linear regression, and it packs in a lot of these great diagnostic tools. Thank you. Very